So hi, yes, I'm Robin Farman Farmian, the girl with the longest last name at the conference. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've worked on seven early stage startup companies, all in cutting edge med tech and biotech. And the reason I started working in cutting edge med tech and biotech is because as a teenager, I was misdiagnosed with an autoimmune disease. It ended up resulting in 43 hospitalizations and six major surgeries. Now, when you're facing surgery, and especially when you're a kid, right? You go from hospital system to hospital system looking for the best doctors out there. So everyone from, say, Dartmouth to Harvard and some of the best hospitals in the United States, none of my doctors said, you know what? Let's hold off on these surgeries because you're so young. Nobody actually looked at me and said, you know what? Technology is hope. But technology is hope. In fact, had something like differential medicine or the conference that I co-founded, which is exponential medicine, existed when I was a teenager, I probably would not have lost three organs. So that's why I do what I do. And that's why I'm up here today to talk to you about how patients can be empowered by technology and really become the CEO of their own healthcare team. So today, Look at a patient, and you can do something like take the AliveCore EKG monitor. Vivek Wadwa actually mentioned that yesterday. What it is is an iPhone case. Retails for about $200 with a prescription, but the point is it's a portable medical device accessible to patients. So what you can do now is take your EKG with your iPhone case, send the data up to the cloud, or your physician can read it from anywhere in the world. And with the advent of telepresent medicine, it's about 20 years old, but it's really starting to catch on. I can now see my physician via FaceTime, Skype, or even a telepresent robot. And what about potentially getting my medication delivered by drone? There's a company called Matternet, prototyping in places like East Africa, the Himalayas, and Dominican Republic, using artificial intelligence-enabled drones to carry about two kilos of medication or vaccine to remote locations. Now, in places like the Himalayas, there are 0.1 doctor for every thousand patients. Talk about game-changing technology getting healthcare into the hands that need it the most. In fact, there are other uses of artificial intelligence-enabled drones. There's a company out of Holland using drones as essentially flying defibrillators, getting the uh, defibrillator to a heart attack victim in under 60 seconds. They go about 60 miles an hour, and they're expecting to increase survival rates in Holland, or actually in the EU, from 8% to 80%. They've got a live stream video camera on them, so that when they get to the heart attack victim, the healthcare professional on the other end of the drone can give step-by-step -step instructions to whomever is with the heart attack victim. So right now, we are experiencing a convergence in medicine, a perfect storm of technological advancements really enabling the era of the patient. So we mentioned yesterday sequencing the genome, $2.7 billion in 2001, a couple thousand today. And by the end of the decade, it's going to be the penny genome. It's actually exceeding Moore's law. So at that point, we are going to be able to sequence the world. We can do predictive analytics, early onset diagnostics, and even a leap towards stage zero medicine. Now, when you're talking about massive amounts of big data like that, you really need to add in, of course, the software component. And IBM Watson is leading the way in AI applied to medicine. Now, what's really cool about Watson is they've opened up their API for anybody to use, whether you're an entrepreneur, a patient, a physician, or even a Fortune 500 company. You now have access to using Watson in your company. Now, why would they do that? Because artificial intelligence actually improves more quickly the more it's used. It's a little bit selfish on IBM's part as well. And hardware. So to me, 3D printing is one of the most disruptive technologies out there across all industries and economies. But it gets especially exciting when you talk about it regarding healthcare. You can do things like 3D print, of course, limbs or casts with holes in them for scratching. Tracheas that are dipped in stem cells and transplanted into patients. We actually did that last year. And things like scoliosis back braces. This is really cool because the reason the majority of patients are not compliant with their scoliosis back braces is because they're so uncomfortable. But with 3D printing, complexity is free. Let me say that again. Complexity is free, meaning it costs the exact same amount of money to 3D print a back brace that is perfectly fitted to my body as it is to anybody else's in the room. And 3D printing of organs, though, is one of the most exciting areas to me. My friend Donna Cryer, similar disease to mine, same set of surgeries, but with an incredibly rare side effect, ended up losing her liver. She became the uh, president of the Liver Foundation, another example of patients disrupting healthcare. But my biggest wish for her 
is that at some point she gets her own liver back. In fact, I'm so passionate about this area of medicine that I actually am now the executive director for the Organ Preservation Alliance. It's a nonprofit really catalyzing breakthroughs in organ transplants, uh, banking, 3D printing of organs, and cryopreservation. But 3D printing of organs is probably on the 15 to 20 year mark, potentially. What can be done right now is people like Organovo, they're really the leader in tissue reengineering. They're able to now print out 3D, 3D printed sections of liver to test drug toxicity. So right now they're using in drug trials and those are generic liver sections, but in a few years, I'm gonna be able to 3D print a version of my own liver to test a drug on it before I actually take it. And infrastructure, so just like with banking and education, infrastructure and content are separating. You are no longer constrained to a physical venue just to receive healthcare. In fact, Anywhere in the world that you have access to a smartphone, you're gonna have access to healthcare. It's expected another three billion people are gonna be going online over the next seven years. All right, so when we're talking about the future of medicine, we're not talking about the future of just one single thing, right? We're talking about the future of many things, working in conjunction with each other. The patient, the doctor, the hospital, the tools, the science, integrated care. So let's delve into just a few of these. The future of the patient. To me, that, bo that word bothers me a little bit, so I like to call them the unpatient or the healthcare consumer. So I said, we are now in an era of patient-driven healthcare. So how does technology empower the unpatient or the healthcare consumer? Well, potentially going to the physician and getting prescribed an app instead of a medication. <coughs> or what about the unprecedented access to information? The majority of, of us in the room probably use Dr. Google <laughs> on a weekly basis, right? Well, Google is starting to redefine what that means because they are prototyping something called Google Hangouts. So when you now search for a disease state, say diabetes, one of your search results are gonna come up and they're gonna say, would you like to see a doctor right now? And a Google Hangout will pop up and you can pay to see a physician right then and there. Micro blood draws. So there's a company called Theranos doing micro blood draws using one one thousandth of the amount of blood needed for a standard typical blood draw. CLIA certified. You can go into Walgreens, which is a huge uh, drugstore chain in the United States. From the end of your finger, you, get, you prick it, you get a drop of blood. You can get your CBC, your platelet, your differential, your liver function test. Do a majority of the normal tests you do in a lab. No longer needing to go to a hospital to get your blood drawn. No longer needing to get two or three vials of blood drawn. You just get a little drop of blood. Now, what's even more exciting about Theranos is they have patents to enter the wearable device market with microneedles, silicone microneedles, the size of a human hair. So they're looking at potentially doing continuous blood monitoring. And patient-driven research platforms. So my friend Sean Ahrens has Crohn's disease, and he decided to become one of the disruptors himself. Founded a company called Chronology, disease-specific peer-to-peer social networking site for patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Now, what started out as a social networking site has morphed into a patient-driven research platform because Sean was finding out he was coming up with insights not found in the literature and that the majority of GI patients had no idea. Specifically, by using the power of the crowd with patients with IBD, he found out that most of those patients cannot tolerate beer, which you're not gonna find that in the literature. And sensors. You've heard of the phrase, the Internet of Things, coined back in 2009. Well, I'm thinking about an internet of you. In fact, by 2019, it's expected that the wearable device market and sensor market is going to be a $50 billion a year industry. And we're starting to see wearables, get, wearables actually get reimbursed in the United States, which is a big deal. Not your Fitbits and your Jawbone Ups, which would be you know, kind of fun, right? But companies like Modus's Stepwatch that measures a number of highly specific clinical metrics relevant to the efficacy of prosthetics and orthotics. And point of care diagnostics, or what I like to call diagnostics on demand. That we're seeing a wide array of compression shirts that do continuous EKG monitoring hit the market. But those are mostly for athletes. But some companies are starting to think about this in terms of the clinical space. A company called Waymu is doing smart shirts for epilepsy diagnostics and, uh, and prevention, or not prevention, I'm sorry, uh, just monitoring. There are other companies like Sensoria, they have a compression shirt on the market for athletes, but they're actually in prototype form doing socks that measure gait for neurodegenerative diseases. And there's a company out of 
Israel called Health Watch. It has a 15 lead EKG shirt just for clinical use. Other really cool things in the point of care diagnostics market. GE partnered with the University of Washington last year to do a paper based microfluidic exam. Test for infectious diseases uses a nose swab, and you get the results in under an hour in the field. And your activity monitor on your computer, you know what I'm talking about, right? It does basic troubleshooting, diagnostics, tells you about your computer usage. Well, I'm thinking about a biometric activity monitor. What, what would that look like? Well, similar to potentially Apple's health kit, but a little bit more advanced. Not only would it integrate into things like your EMR, but the first thing that majority of us now do in the morning, we don't grab a cup of coffee, right? We grab our smartphone. So I'm gonna grab my smartphone, it's gonna come up with my biometric activity monitor. It's gonna tell me about not only my health, like potentially my blood pressure is off and I need to tweak my medication, it will automatically alert my doctor so the doctor can now email me and tweak my medication. It'll aggregate my family's data so I know what's going on with everyone in my family, and it will aggregate all of my wearable tech devices. Now, I love the quantified self movement. In fact, I've been in it since about 2008, 2009 when it was a grassroots movement, but I'm not wearing a QS device today. Why? Well, my Fitbit battery died again, and I put it down somewhere in my house again, and I lost it for the third time this year. And you know, all those awesome new bracelets, like the uh, those smart watches or the Jawbone Ups or Misfit wearables, well, my wrists are tiny and delicate, and if I try to put some of those on, it actually hurt. And while potentially you could go with this outfit, you're not gonna go with the majority of my outfits, which is a huge consideration when you are talking about patient engagement and compliance. Because if a patient doesn't like the way something looks, they're not gonna use it. But technology makes things seamless. The way I see this going is not just epidermal electronics, like companies like MC10, which are doing temporary tattoos, Bluetooth-enabled, do continuous biometric activity data monitoring, but there's a company called New Deal Design. They're actually the, the original designers behind the Fitbit, and they're doing a concept right now where they're doing subcutaneous tattoos in the palm of your hand. It does continuous biometric activity data monitoring, but it also will be able to open up smart locks and actually record who you've seen that day. Having a, there we go. And all of this technology is really raising the bar on the interaction between the patient and the physician. So if you think back to the title of my talk, the patient as the CEO of the healthcare team, and just like the CEO of a corporation, where you surround yourself with a fantastic array of vice presidents and board members, support staff, advisors, they do their job, synthesize the information, and report back to you as CEO. Together, you, just, you determine a direction for the company to go into, but as CEO, you're the one who is ultimately responsible that that vision is carried out and that the company overall is successful. Why should being a patient be any different? All right, so with the future of the patient changing, what does the future of the hospital look like purely from the patient's point of view? Well, a lot of things can move out of the hospital. Continuous monitoring, no longer needing to be admitted just to be monitored. What about things like, I told you about blood draws, but what about IV placement? There's a company called VBOT. In prototype form, they use robotic insertion of IVs and blood draws. Right now, they are at 85% success rate of finding the vein on the first try. Now, if you go to a hospital, success rate is about 75 to 80% of finding the vein on the first try. They're using ultrasound, infra special infrared, and uh, imaging software to determine where the vein is. In fact, there are times when I've gotten IVs and I've actually had to be stuck five times. Really, five times? By the time VBOT hits the market, I'm gonna be one of the first to sign up. And your at-home clinic is going to rival what your doctor's office looked like just a few years ago. With so many different things like point-of-care diagnostics moving out of the hospital, what really needs to stay in? Well, gross wound care, right? Hands-on expertise for the ICU and the, and the NICU. And of course, surgery. But if I were designing a hospital now from the ground floor, in addition to making it function and feel a little bit more like a hotel, which is actually a trend now with some of the new hospitals, I would make sure that my surgical amphitheater was fully roboticized and modular. Roboticized so that I could see the best surgeons in the world no matter where they were. 
but modular because instead of replacing a $2 million robot when the technology improves, I want to be able to switch out a $30,000 part. And hospitals will need to learn how to provide an entirely new set of services. I'm envisioning a command center similar to NASA's, though hopefully no one calls Houston. <laughs> Data management, interoperability, localized and remote monitoring. And this is the fun concept, potentially having the ER as a dispatch center. Because with all of this point of care diagnostics and remote monitoring, if you do need to go to the hospital, your data can actually arrive before you do essentially triaging yourself on your way to the hospital. This means hopefully that you get to bypass the purgatory of the three or four hour wait, potentially go to the correct part of the hospital where you need to receive care. And a tune-up hospital. So this is something I've actually been dreaming about for about 20 years. Mayo Clinic is starting to do something along these lines, but I haven't seen it start to you know, take hold worldwide yet. I'm thinking about you know, chronic disease patients, a planned check-in, right? And the reason that majority of like chronic disease patients, if they're very sick, don't have a full-time job, it's not because they don't feel well, it's because they spend their life going to doctors, right? Seven, eight, nine, ten different doctors sometimes because doctors are so siloed. In fact, they don't spend their life in doctor's offices, they spend their life in waiting rooms. So let's eradicate that. Plan check-in, two or three days, see all of your doctors back to back, get all of your tests back to back. And if you're being seen this way, your doctors can meet right, and discuss your case. Now, when you're normally hospitalized, your doctors may discuss your case, but it's usually about that acute condition and not your overall care. So let's improve outcomes this way. All right, so with the future of the patient changing, what does the future of the doctor look like purely from the patient's point of view? Well, we're experiencing an information explosion, the rapid acceleration of technological discovery. How are physicians supposed to keep up with the sheer amount of clinical and research data coming at them? In fact, in 1970, there were 10 specialties. Today, over 170. So I propose that doctors are going to need to become medical engineers. Data literate, genome literate, device enabled, technically adept, and most importantly, collaborative with the patient. Some of the tools that are really helping with physicians, or even, in fact, replacing them. In fact, Vinod Khosla is a, a big proponent of artificial intelligence actually replacing the physician. Now, why physicians like things like IBM Watson AI is because not only does it give you the top three probabilities of a diagnosis, but it gives you the evidence trail behind them, which is so very important. It's a company called CrowdMed up in Silicon Valley, using the power of the crowd to do basic diagnostics. In fact, they found out that their crowd, that the, most of the people that use their site, are retired healthcare professionals. And XPRIZE is really spurring on innovation in this particular sector, with things like the Tricorder $10 million incentivized prize. What it is, is like a device about this big that can be used in the field without the presence of a doctor. It needs to be able to diagnose 15 diseases and measure five vital signs, essentially replacing the doctor. And doctors are now going to be able to serve a global patient pool. Or if you turn that around, as a patient, you now can see a doctor, no matter where they are in the world. But the biggest change is really going to be around the mindset between the patient and the physician. So if the patient is now the CEO of the healthcare team, that causes a massive shift in the power dynamic. How are physicians going to react? Hopefully, it'll mandate a lot more mutual respect. And if the patient feels like they're on the team that are making the decisions, hopefully they'll be more engaged, more compliant, and we're going to improve outcomes. But there could be some pitfalls, too, because patients could come into the doctor's office thinking they know more than they do, right, or worse, misdiagnose at home and never see a doctor. <coughs> so I'd like you to consider some things. Will the data-enabled patient stress or unstress the healthcare provider? Regulatory agencies are really not keeping pace with technology, specifically the FDA is one of the worst out there, right? So how can some of these technologies be streamlined so that we can get these innovations into the hands that need it the most? And if you're the CEO of your own healthcare team, and I mean every single person in this room is now the CEO of their own healthcare team, how are you going to start to change your behavior today? So just like I did over a decade ago, when I stopped allowing medicine to disrupt my life and I became the disruptor, imagine a world where more patients are doing that. <coughs> to me, the future of the patient is the future of medicine. Thank you.